Welcome back, investors, to CRE Evening Network. Today, we have Yossi Telovitz and Jacob Hosner protecting the multifamily investment, a guide to managing risk and insurance. Welcome, gentlemen. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, George for giving me this amazing opportunity to speak with people in this community and also thank for all ways that you bring um, all the real estate people into under one roof. That's the first appreciation to you. And I guess Martha agrees on that always, right? What yours is value that he brings along the way. And that's number one. And the number two, after me and George met the first time and Martha, it was impressing to see how real estate people are very good on the real estate side and they want to know more on the insurance side. What I felt is important for this show, what triggered to make me to make the show happen is uh, when it comes to the insurance, I want my peoples and the real estate industry to have more control on their insurance, regardless of whatever broker they use, they can choose to work with what they love, but they have control on what to look a little bit of education so they can get the best for the bottom line. We had situations where I, in my past, I worked with real estate investors and they found out that their broker was the close friend, but they had a simple water damage and it was a full water exclusion. So on the policy, we don't want to have them become insurance professionals. I get that argument all the time, but we want them to have as much as basic knowledge so they can take again, you know, control and, and get their bottom line. That's the reason of today's call. So the call today class is protecting the multifamily investment, a guide to management and risk and insurance. And I have a Jacob Pastor came and joined. So Jacob, you can move on to page two. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to meet you all uh, virtually, and I'm sure we'll follow up later. Uh, let me begin with the fact that risk and insurance, you see that on the title. Think of risk as the bigger umbrella of managing various types of hazards, and insurance being something underneath that umbrella, a tool that we use to help to manage those risks. We're going into that in a lot of detail today. In fact, we've got a lot of material to, gov to cover. So let's begin with a few basic definitions. Uh, Yossi, you want to talk about the basics? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. but Jacob, keep make sure to get the screen moving timely. So what is a multifamily property? Just let's talk basic terms. Also known as habitational real estate, phrased in the insurance industry, or a commercial, because it's for profit, residential property. Technically speaking, it's a for profit property made to use for space. Think of living not workspace, not your office building, not your warehouse, apartments, condos, and dwellings in the insurance industry is referred to one to four family units. We've referred it as dwelling. Okay, the benefits of a multifamily property investment. I got people like Martha, George, that spend hours and hours to understand the benefits. I don't need to tell them. They spend the money to learn that, but just to get the terminology, appreciation, right? Equity growth, cash flow, Passive income, scalable, simplicity, simplified financing, and tax advantages. That's probably, George, the main reasons why people get into real estate. Anything here to add, George? Love the list. Okay, beautiful. Okay. Right? Now we got to have the challenges of the multifamily property investment, right? Just to get in in competition, right? There's a fair good deal, a seller in the mood of selling. But you got the competition able to make your fear offer, right? To get into the deal and still have the competition get you out. But once you close a deal, then maybe your good friend is still also purchasing the same year area, a good piece of real estate and you're also looking for tenants. So you got competition for good tenants sometimes. Greater initial capital investment, that's a huge one, right? Where you need to fundraise the money. Property management, you got everything up and running, you got the money. And to the last of the list, but not the least, it's a big one. We're going to talk about protecting your investment. You got all the great one work done. You got the competition necked out. You got the initial investment. You got the property manager. And now as the owner, you want to protect your investment. I might add to that, that now we're going, and the, one of the main purposes of this meeting, ladies and gentlemen, is to help you think about protecting the, the investment in a proactive basis not as an afterthought when it's time to close the deal or whatever. So when we speak about protecting investment, we talk about basically two things, risk management, the greater umbrella, and insurance after that. 
So who and what is a risk manager? Risk management people are people who have expertise to identify risks, minimize those risks, try to eliminate those risks if possible, and to share those risks. Uh, in my line of business as a risk manager, uh, I've been working in the insurance, commercial insurance uh, world for over 25 years. I uh, own three different insurance agencies and I uh, work now pretty much exclusively as an educator and risk manager. It's a great job and a lot of fun, but it requires a lot of analysis, uh, a lot of uh, deep diving into fine print and things like that. But uh, the reward of it, I think, is tremendous uh, because what we can do for our clients is to help them maximize their profitability, minimize the possibility of unforeseen hazards, and uh, get a better return on their investment in the long, in the long run. So sharing risks is the insurance component. And we're gonna spend a lot of time on that because once we identify the risk, we wanna find some way of passing that risk off to somebody else, the insurance company at a fair and reasonable price, but at a risk that's calculable. And we're gonna get in behind of what's behind the curtain over there as well. So when we talk about multifamily investments in risk management, the first thing I look for is what owners are responsible for. You buy a property, what are you responsible for on a broader basis, on the big picture? Of course, you have the physical property, the risks and the hazards associated with it. Secondly, we have the property safety, the accessibility and the environmental aspect of the property. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, physical aspect of the property. Then we have the tenant and visitor liability and safety. And we're getting into something uh, a little more fuzzy because it's easy to uh, for, forecast and to predict uh, what's good or bad about a physical property of, a, of an investment, a property. You can find out that if the uh, apartment building is uh, on the on the border of a polluted river, uh, obviously there's a hazard there, but you never know what you have when you get to tenants and visitors. The liability and the safety behind that is your responsibility as well. We're gonna start with a couple of examples uh, and not to scare the boots off of you, but just to give you an idea of how risk management and insurance uh, sometimes do and sometimes don't work together. Yossi, do you want to take this one or you'd like me to dive through? You can, you can go back on one page before. I wanted to dive in on that one if you're going back one page. Sure. So when you're buying a piece of property as a real estate investor, you're doing your due diligence, looking on the condition of the building. What is the, the maintenance going to cost? And that in conjunction those so physical property risks and hazards. But the, as the fuzzy thing is the tenant visitor. I have the best property management company in place. It's a safe place. But if your tenant at some point is being, we'll talk about down the road, assaulted or ne neglect, uh, there was an, a neglection of taking care of him, you as the owner can be sued with liabilities. So that's kind of like out of your hand. In that case, you at least want to do the best you can. And at least at the end, the most you want to have the best insurance on that part. And we'll de deep dive in. Okay, and on this one, a multifamily investment case study, the, the point of this next two uh, ones we want to do is, back to our point, we want to bring real scenarios that actually happen where real estate owners have their insurance brokers do the work, but they found out in a bad event because they weren't aware of those small little, little words in the policy that excluded certain coverages. They did have the decent coverages in two cases. There's a total loss. Literally, the policy was worthless. In a certain case, he had a decent uh, a policy that covered basic perils, but just that one scenario we'll talk about really big, was big financial damage. So we had a low-income apartment complex, 100 units in Tennessee. We had a, like a local gang caused a fire by arson. The tech, so we had first property damage, and then we had the tenants were assaulted and robbed was a, a hot night over there and the landlord was sued for negligence for safety and protection so first of all you have property damage that's number one but the property damage the fire was caused by arson right okay that's vandalism then we had the tenants were and were on a safety condition so the tenant the owner had two problems physical property damage 
and then he had the tenants were harassed and 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 in different kind of ways. So the owners had no coverage for vandalism, if a malicious mischief or assault and battery. So just to uh, kind of deepen, this is a huge one I want to share with real estate owners. On your policy, you should be looking around. There's an exclusion named assault and battery exclusion. And the name of the exclusion represents the well. If you can have the best property manager, safest area, if someone walks in your property in there and assaults a different tenant, you can be in vacation or an assault a third party on there, verbally or 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 on a battery way with a physical item you can be massive sued i personally had clients that were sued like close to a million dollars and that was in the bronx so on a short fire damage in that case state it was three hundred fifty thousand because you had a vandalism exclusion and the court award the tenants 1.2 million for all the robberies and for the assault and battery that was going on so you want to be careful and you want to make sure to try to learn a little bit so you can review your policies before we continue, there's someone in the audience whose microphone is open and uh, generating a lot of background noise. Could you please check your microphone? Thank you. Next case study. This is a good one. This one was a apartment complex, 200 units in Virginia. Winter storm, right? Our regular good weathers came across. I guess it wasn't this year because 2021. In New York, it's almost summer the whole year. So you got a winter storm, the power goes out. From the winter storm, the roof was damaged by wind. The insurance, he did have insurance coverage, wind and hail damage. So you had a decent broker in case. He did have wind and hail coverage. But from this wind, the pipe freezes, and then it bursts is $250,000 of water damage, interior water damage. Then this is a new, this is a thing I, um, I just said, and uh, there's a, a coverage called audience or law. Okay. Um, I want to share jump off from this case study, go to a personal claim. I currently have open in Orlando, Florida, on a big hotel. So audience or law, if you got, for example, let's take a building that was built in 1995. Okay. And the building is damaged in 2022. So whatever that fire made a loss to your property, Okay, so you want to get from your insurance company, event to claim back their money. Now, when you're going ahead and getting your contract on board and rebuild that damaged building, now there's additional expenses other than the building that was lost in the fire, because now you need to comply with the new building codes, right? This was built years ago with the old building codes. That additional is four hundred thousand dollars for the whatever it's a handicapped equipment or whatever it is. So no coverage for water damage or audience or law. The total loss on this case was a $900,000 loss. The total insured loss was a $250,000 for the wind coverage he had, but he was uninsured for $650,000 between the water damage exclusion he had or the audience or law. So just to get you some awareness, you can keep going, Jacob, on the next one. So how can risk management lower costs and secure better coverage and improve profitability? We look at this from a number of different perspectives, and we're going to touch over a, a lot of them today. If you have questions, please write them down. If we can't answer them today, uh, we'll get, circle back to us and we'll get to that later. But we want to touch on a number of important points. Some of them may uh, trigger uh, an event or an occurrence that you've had familiarity with, and others may just inspire you with new ideas, hopefully. Number one, everyone talks about location. But in this situation, we're talking about the location besides the marketability and the tenant appeal and the rent potential. We're talking about location of the building physically in its proximity to physical hazards. If it's a coastal property, it's in a flood zone, it's in an area where storms uh, can cause a lot of damage. Uh, some areas, especially urban areas, have area crime. So you can check crime rates and see if there's going to be a liability type hazards in that particular area. We have something called protection class. I don't know if that's a familiar term with uh, mainstream America, but it's basically a number one, two, three, four, five that we can identify to a property. And it tells us what the access to emergency medical police and fire services is. That's very important for a number of points of view, uh, obviously for the fire protection and the police protection, but it's also something the insurance company looks for to see 
about the insurability of that particular property and where it's located. We look at property management. How is the current property managed now from an insurability point of view? What's its condition and what's its upkeep and what's its damage potential physically? This has a lot to do with cost of insurance and it has a lot to do with risk management. We look for uh, latent, what we call latent or hidden damage and defects in the property. Generally, by the way, a good property inspector can find that for you and deliver a report. Most of the hidden damage is found in plumbing, uh, HVAC systems and electrical work. We look for water damage, uh, not only current water damage, but old water damage uh, from defective plumbing. Mold and mildew is a huge one because it's something you can't see until you end up tearing a wall open or something. And now you've got a $25,000 claim in a very small area. Just imagine if it happened to be big. Fire hazards. And then we look, uh, as uh, Yossi had mentioned a moment ago about ordinance or law, we look at the age of the building. Are there any structural or code related risks uh, due to the age of the building? I'm not saying that an old building isn't insurable or isn't a good investment. In fact, they can be fantastic. Just knowing that the age of the building and how well it's maintained is something that we look for. Uh, we mentioned ordin ordinance or law and that it covers the demolition and repair to the undamaged and the damaged portion of the building. We'll talk about this in greater detail, but it's very important when we come to habitational property investments, whether or not there is ordinance or law and how it might work. <clears throat> and these hey, are- uh, So yes, you sir? want to share with people why you're sharing this information as early prepared. What, why we're sharing this information with everybody? Go ahead, I'll talk about ordinance or law, you talk about why. So if you can go back even two pages, right? As investor, brokers, or yourself going out looking on deals, um, you want to understand like insurance, I think for real estate investors, we want to know what the cost is, even if you're on the right conservatively, you want to start understanding what insurance companies are looking for, or what are the things that make them look this as a bad property. So you can, when you're looking at the, I want to add to your value, talk early to your agent. I want to add to your value. When you underwrite a deal, underwrite a specific more things in there so you can better underwrite the insurance cost and long-term risk regardless of the policy. That's why. So for example, age of the building, there's a lot of stuff if you would know how it protection class we spoke about. So simple, if the building has is a middle of a nowhere and the closest fire station is far away from that, that makes that for protection class eight or nine, the higher number it is, that really can be the, a nice building, a beautiful building, non-combustible material with sprinklers. But because it's protection class eight, far away from fire department access or water pump access, that puts the building as a high risk. So you already got this nice, beautiful condition of building far away from emergency access. That puts your portfolio in a low place where there's no appetite for insurance companies. That's why we're assuring this information. Go ahead, Jacob. Thank you. We mentioned ordinance or law. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit in more detail about this particular coverage. And we already mentioned why it's important. There are three components of ordinance or law. One, it applies to the loss to the undamaged portion of the building. Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen uh, amazing as it may seem, when a property gets damaged, if you, don't have, if you haven't seen this before already, you may have someone from code enforcement for the county or the city come out and say, hmm, this building is damaged more than 35%. We require that the entire building be brought up to code, electrical, plumbing, HVAC, uh, ADA compliance, and so on. So you have to demolish component portions of the undamaged portion of the building. And then you have to pay for the upgrade for the electric, uh, plumbing, and so on to the undamaged portion of the building above and beyond the actual damage portion of the building itself. So the cost, especially when you look at these larger habitational properties, the cost of ordinance or law can be quite substantial. And in terms of a profitability point of view, this can really put a, a bad ding on the, the long-term profitability of this, policy, this property before you can ever recoup from the loss. So you look for 
good coverage in this area. If you have a good risk manager or a good agent who's already looking out for this, great. I'm also going to mention that is, this is especially important to older buildings because, as we mentioned before, older buildings have a longer time span of changes in ordinance, the building code. So that means that there's going to be a lot more code enforcement, a lot more things that need to be upgraded at a lot bigger cost than a newer building. Tenant management, current vacancy, and tenant turnover rates. These are some things that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping many of you look for already when you look at an OM or an existing property. Maybe you talk to the property manager or the existing owner, find out what the, the turnover rate is and what the tenant situation is all about. Bad tenants can cause property damage and they can discourage good tenants. So you want to, dis, you want to improve uh, or at least establish a solid tenant screening and background checks for risk man, from a risk management point of view. We look, we look for moral risks. That's the kind of people that you have in the building. Uh, that's why you do background checks and credit reports. We look for animal liability. Hey, pet friendly properties are great. They can be a money maker for you. Uh, they can draw good and, and very attractive tenants to the property, but you just have to make sure that that's managed a, at a good level. I know some of you probably have experience with habitational properties where maybe you say, okay, uh, we allow dogs uh, less than 25 pounds. Great, as an example. Uh, but maybe it has to go a little bit further than that. We'll talk about it in just a minute. You've probably dealt with squatters, people who don't want to leave and you have to push them out. And you also wanna look for high eviction rates when you're looking from a risk management point of view on these properties. Which brings us to professional property managers. Some people like to manage their property themselves or have an employee or someone who manages these properties. Other hire professional property managers. Good property managers accept the risk and transfer that risk from you to themselves for the tenant screening and the property maintenance, the rent collection, security and crime, and crime prevention. They handle the evictions for you. And they, so when they do those things, you wanna get a copy of whatever their standard lease looks like, just to see and share that with your agent or risk manager, just to see what's in there and how this property manager operates. For, again, from a risk management point of view, that might be something that can work in your favor or against you as far as the insurance company is concerned. So have your agent review their proof of coverage as well. Good property managers have something called professional liability insurance. It is the insurance component that covers all the professional activities of interacting with the tenants, like screening, collection, evictions, and so on. If there's a problem with an eviction or collection or a screened employ uh, tenant, one of the things that's gonna happen is they're gonna go after the property manager first and the, you, the owner, second. So it's something to look out for. I also wanted to add on to this one, um, the idea of insurance is transfer financial loss in that case. When it's an insurance claim, it's already transferred a financial loss to an insurance company. That's the idea of dealing with risk. But to minimize and mitigate risk, one of the ways is, as Jacob just mentioned, is to um, have the right property manager in place. That's a huge one. And I've seen some people have property managers, even big with portfolios. I encourage um, to have spend a little bit of money to put a right risk transfer agreement with the property manager, pay money for an attorney. You probably have your all have your real estate attorney write up a decent go um an agreement where the property manager takes takes the full risk on him when anything happens so that's another way of transferring risk and i'm trying to say and not just grab any random agreement i found real estate owners take agreements from online or just stand agreements it's worth if you have a nice portfolio you want to make sure to, to pay some money for an attorney to put that contract in place that's it's that's a key well said josie well said so we're talking about property risks from the insurance company. What is the underwriter? What is the guy who works behind the curtain 
that the insurance company does. You know, they don't come up with these rates by magic. They actually look at a lot of different criteria. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But one of the first things they do is they classify properties uh, based on some of these different variables like location, amenities, the age, and so on. And they put those into a basic groups. The first one is called Class A. And these are the better location, higher rent, high amenity type properties that we all love to have because that brings in the high rent. They have tenants that are have long-term uh, leases and stay there for a long time, low turnover, uh, they're well-maintained and they look good. These are also the cheapest to insure on a dollar per square foot sort of basis. But you remember the most class A properties have more amenities, which have to be insured as well. Class B is basically a class A property that may have great substance to it, but maybe they suffered neglect or they just need renovation. Maybe they're not in quite a good location or have quite as good amenities as the class A properties, but they're a close second. By the way, these were, it would be a great target if I were a property investor. Class C is a higher risk. These are properties that I know people out there say, wow, I can get the property really cheap. Uh, it's a government subsidized housing perhaps, or something like that. Um, yes, that's all true. But these are also more complicated from a risk management perspective, because we find that the poor locations have higher crime rates, higher tenant turnover. They have more problems with liability of all sorts as you could see from the examples we talked about. And the cost of insurance can be very challenging. If the cost of insurance isn't challenging, that would be another red flag for you, the owner investor, because that means there's probably exclusions and limitations in the insurance. There's things in there in the fine print that aren't gonna be offered to you because the property is a higher risk. And this is where your risk manager and your agent really need to be key, keyed in on it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not telling you this because I'm trying to discourage you from Class C properties. I just want to make sure you walk into these things with your eyes open. Also important to note that um, real estate investors, when you have hot properties, student housing, or you got Section 8 tenants, it sounds, oh, it's just collecting the rent from Section 8. It's important to mention those. Some policies have exclusions to those low-income housing tenants. So you want to make sure this is something you mention now to your agent. Now we get to something interesting called idiosyncratic risk. This is a kind of risk that's very unique to one particular property. Again, this is sort of like your class C only with a twist. It's likely due that there are properties that are, that are due to something called dependent properties. Uh, that would be idi idiosyncratic uh, to this particular habitational risk. We have uh, maybe some building that was designed and repurposed for something else, like a condo conversion. I got one on my desk right now I'm working with. It's a uh, hotel that's being renovated and remodeled into apartments. Well, uh, that's good. And if it's in a good location and they do good construction work, they could probably come out with a good outcome. Uh, sometimes, depending on the nature of the building, the design and repurpose of it may create higher risks or more or other complications that you don't find when the building is actually built for the purpose that it was made for. And again, this is a, a yellow flag for an underwriter at an insurance company. Uh, I mentioned dependent properties. I'm going to define that for you. A dependent property is a habitational property of some kind that is dependent on a local industry or business or attraction in order to function. A good example, uh, here in Great Sunshine State, we have a place called Orlando, and there's a lot of attractions in that area. Lots of attractions, Disney, uh, Universal, and so on. And uh, as a result, there's a lot of great um, property opportunity there. Uh, a dependent property would be an apartment building next to Disney World where the employees work. And with, if Disney World crashes, guess what happens to the tenants of the property? They're unemployed and they all leave. Now you have a very idiosyncratic risk because you've got a whole building full of people who don't have a job. Something to look at and to consider as well. 
We also see idiosyncratic risk with eth ethnic communities. That can be idiosyncratic in a good way or in a bad way, depending on the property and the location and the community. Sometimes due to ge poor geographic proximity. I mentioned polluted river. I, I had one of those in my time. Somebody had a great uh, apartment building. It turns out that a manufacturing company that was upriver of this apartment complex uh, was dumping pollution or actually did a huge dump of pollution into the river. It destroyed the river, wiped out the wildlife, even the, the, the plants and the trees along the coast of the bank of the river. And the whole thing turned into a huge stinky mess. So instead of having an attraction by having this next to their apartment building, it turned out to be a big detriment. So now let's get into property insurance bear basics. What can we do to get the best carriers, the best coverage and the best cost of our insurance so we can comfortably tra transfer that risk to the insurance company at a price that we can afford and make sure that we have all the coverage we need at that right price. Yossi, you wanna talk about this for a second? No, you, you keep going, you're doing a good okay. job. I'm on a roll, thank you. So we'll talk about the property insurance. So one, in fact, you probably picked on me for a good reason, Yossi, because one of the things I've done uh, in the past is work with underwriters and insurance companies that actually wrote and, wrote and taught a few classes for them. And they're very interesting people, underwriters. Uh, the first thing I'd like to mention about underwriting uh, property insurance is that yes, uh, insurance companies have guidelines, they have computerized systems that do a lot of analytics and calculations on the, uh, the potential of risk based on whatever information you put in. You can just put in an address nowadays and the computer is gonna spit out something about that property. But the underwriter is a human and they're a little bit nebbish in what they do, but one of the things they have the ability for is if they see that somebody's buying this building and knows how to run a property like this and has their act together in terms of managing the property, they are a more favorable risk and the underwriter can actually override some of the settings in their system and uh, call for better coverage at a lower premium because they wanna make their insurance policy attractive to you, the owner, and make sure or, or try to secure you as an owner for a long-term uh, relationship. So this is what the underwriter is thinking when you approach him, or I should say you, your agent or your risk manager approach him. Here's some of the things they look for. Location and protection class. Is it favorable or not? What was the year built and what kind of construction is it? Sticks, bricks, or metal? Physical features. Are there any adjacent structures, any connected buildings, anything that be a pro or a con to this particular property? What is the design and intended use of the property, as I mentioned before? What kind of utilities do they have? What I mean in this case is the plumbing and the wiring and uh, all the functional aspects of the building in good working order and up to date. Maybe within the last 10 years would be a good rule of thumb, 15 max. Is there additional building property like uh, elevators, security systems, uh, HVAC systems? Uh, what kind of considerations they put into those? Uh, and in many cases, they're considered assets, but by the way, additional insured assets. What is the roof type? What is the age of the roof and what is the material? Uh, here in the land of natural disasters, Florida, where we have more hurricanes and tornadoes than anybody else, uh, roofs are really important and their age, their type and their material is a heavy consideration whether or not you can have wind and hail coverage as we mentioned before. Has the building ever been renovated? And if so, how long ago and by what? That's a big consideration for an underwriter as well. One second, um, Jacob, to go back a second on the previous page. Uh, I wanna ask that, George, are you here with us? He's I muted, was, I think. George, or yes, I'm here. Is, yeah, George, uh, when you look on the property, right, from a real estate perspective, year built, how does that work with you? Like, 
there's the how old is there an age of building you wouldn't go over how does that work i don't know there's necessarily an age that i wouldn't go over but buildings in the 70s or more recent don't have as much trouble as older structures i have one as old as 1950 and i actually own a single family home built in 1920 so i can tell you all three ages of building have different types of troubles like, Perfect. for example, 1990s, uh, no, 80s, they put the polybutylene in a lot of buildings, right? And you get those pinhole punctures. That's something you're going to see only from that era, from the 1970s, early 70s. I think it was up to 1974. You might see aluminum because commodities were so expensive. That aluminum wiring, that can be difficult to insure, can be expensive to take out. So every every <clears throat> vintage of building has its own issues. Right, right. Okay. Good. Good on that one. So we talked uh, about physical characteristics here, and now we're going to go into the non-physical aspect. Who is the management and maintenance? One of the things you'll find underwriters at insurance companies are interested in knowing is how long have you been doing this and who's in charge and how is it being done at the other properties that you own? If we can document that favorably, it works very, very well in your favor in terms of insurance. Is there any property or maintenance employees? Do you have your own or do you have a property manager or who and how is that taken care of? What's your experience in multifamily? Was a property inspected and was the history evaluated? Uh, a good report from a good reporter inspector can go a long way. What are the lease terms? Is it pet friendly? There's the liability, by the way. And what is the longevity and security of the, of the lease and what do they do? You have a high turnover property that's a greater risk than a low turnover property. I mentioned pet friendly a couple of times. I'm gonna just charge off on that one for a second because it's a great opportunity to make additional revenue for a, a smart property manager, uh, but it can also be an, an animal liability exposure. Uh, I have, in my time, experienced uh, hazards and claims for almost every imaginable animal, reptile, and insect you can imagine. So when, uh, as, a, as a word to the wise here, when you say pet friendly, be very specific about what that means in your lease. No pets allowed of any kind, or if pets are allowed, specify the species. Uh, whether or not they're animal, vegetable, insect, uh, reptiles, or whatever. Uh, I've seen a claim for somebody who was injured by a exotic toxic fish in a fish tank. Uh, somebody's uh, scorpion collection in their apartment building and the something uh, display case knocked down and there were scorpions running all over up and down the hallway of the building. Just imagine if somebody's three-year-old got stung. So pet friendly is something you wanna look at very carefully, just define it well, and uh, you can enjoy the additional uh, income from the pets, uh, having that uh, attraction to the tenants, and uh, just uh, that make sure you have it protected well. We talked about tenants and tenancy. I think everyone here pretty well understands long-term versus high turnover and whether or not credit and background checks are done on a regular basis. You might require renter's insurance, by the way, for someone who has that pet uh, to protect you and them from a claim. And then we look, at, you, we look at amenities in the properties as well. Pools are an attraction, but they can also be a hazard unless they're made safe. Laundry, again, another attraction. Outdoor recreation is great. People love that when they look for habitational property all of these things, as long as they're done well. Okay, I already talked about the pet friendly. Uh, safety and security is becoming huge nowadays because now we run into stories in the news and the media about all kinds of weird things happening to people, um, not just in the street, but in the lobby of their apartment building. Loss history. We talk, we use a word called loss runs in the insurance business. This is something that you want to look for at the very beginning when you're entertaining a new property 
ask them for the loss history from the insurance company. Yossi, you want to dive in on that for a second? Yeah, what I'm trying to bring to the table here today, loss runs as a piece of document that it's become a necessary item for the real estate owners to provide to um, special or larger cases and larger scale properties to the insurance agents. But it was never utilized as a piece of help of research underwriting document for you, for the real estate owner. So what I'm trying to bring the new idea to the table is if you are early on in the stage where you can request loss runs of the seller of your broker, not because your insurance agent needs, this is another way you will find out what is the liabilities am I going into by acquiring this property? Maybe some reports you're not going to see there was even a water damage. Who says the water damage claim was properly repaired? Maybe there was just they knew they're going to sell the building in three years to just they just repair it in a weak way. And now you're the new owner and there was no other way. And the loss runs, boom, you see there was a water damage claim. Liabilities, what type of tenants I'm going to have? What type? So I'm trying to bring this new idea where loss runs can become a good another resource for real estate owners not just for the insurance side, to see what was going on this property. So that's a good idea. And prior coverage from there on Jacob. Back to lost history, one more. I'm going to share a short story. We had a property where uh, we looked for lost history uh, in the risk management stage, in the analysis stage. We found that this property had four assault and batteries in a six-year period of time. And that's something that, uh, how can you mitigate that? Well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, we are trying to get it um, insured by the insurance company. So we installed security systems, uh, uh, outdoor lighting, uh, and improved the security on, a, uh, on the entry to the building and all the exits and entries to the building. Um, it didn't eliminate the, the risk and we couldn't get coverage on it, but it certainly helped to minimize the likelihood of that kind of a problem happening and the owner of the property and or his property manager getting involved in a very, very difficult lawsuit. And also on the loss runs, um, in terms when you buy, when you underwrite, let's say you even underwrite conservative, what the premium cost will be for your insurance. Getting the loss runs early can literally determine your rate. So an agent like myself, okay, the property's in this and this area. This is the total insured value. This is the amount of units occupied. You give me all the numbers and I'll bring you back a, uh, with pleasure, and a higher number at the conservative side and a lower number what the insurance to, will be. So you can get that in your underwriting for your deal. But then if you show up in the end, and you got some very bad losses in there because in the old good days, you could buy a bigger, large, uh, larger scale property and say, I got no losses, three, this is new purchase. But today with the property market being so tough, insurance companies wouldn't bend at least at the time of binding, sometimes not, wouldn't even release a quote, but at time of binding without loss runs. So you want to get your loss runs up front so you know to, uh, you can give that to your agent early on in the deal so to calculate what your insurance cost would be. So you're not living in, in guessing numbers. Well said. I'm moving along because we're running short on time, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the big question. I'm sure this is half the people uh, that are here today. Why are property premiums increasing on multifamily? Number one, globally, we've had a five time increase in natural disasters. It's increased by five in the last 50 years. And uh, my home state, Florida, wins first place. What do you know? Blunders in legislation increase litigation everywhere. Litig legislation, at least one example in Florida, that has caused a huge uh, financial catastrophe for, for insurance companies is called, uh, it's called assignment of benefits. We have so many natural disasters in Florida that the legislature decided they were going to streamline the claims processing of uh, all these claims that were coming through from every natural disaster. You can imagine thousands and thousands of claims coming into the insurance companies. So what they did is they legislated so that you could assign the benefits, the assign the repair of the damage of your roof, for example, directly to the roofing company, and they would take, go out and settle the claim for you. 
the owner didn't have to do anything except sign a piece of paper and somebody else took care of all the paperwork. It turned into a disaster because uh, in South Florida, for example, they had people literally roofing companies were knocking on people's door and saying, hey, I can get you a new roof on your house. Just sign this piece of paper. Can you imagine how that would work? Anyway, so we have these blunders in legislation that have been reversed, by the way. I wrote an article on this a couple of, a few weeks ago. You might want to check it out. And we've also had a huge increase in litigation everywhere. This is going back to the liability side of property. The global supply chain of disruptions have caused huge material shortages. I don't know how people keep track of this, but if you walk into a, a home improvement store like uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, you're gonna find that the cost of uh, drywall and lumber and all the basic stuff for building a property has more than doubled or even tripled in some cases in the last couple of years. By the way, imagine what that does to the cost of replacement of a building. We have skyrocketing inflation and construction costs. The construction costs, not only the material for construction, but the actual labor itself. There's a shortage of labor in the construction industry and experienced workers are at a premium right now. As a result, the average premium rates nationally are increasing at a rate of 12% per year. Florida has got a little bit more unique situation. They, uh, well, if you bought a property, you can and see- And that's, no. even, that's even uh, in clean properties, right? Yeah, so this is clean property. <clears throat> so what do we do for insurance? You want well, to talk Jake, about this uh, one? The people on the here know that the insurance uh, cost is up extremely high. They want to know there's something that can be done. <laughs> yes, and we have six minutes to tell them that. Okay. But let's finish with the basics of insurance and we'll go into some more risk management, okay? Directors and officers. Uh, I'm sure some of you uh, out there work in collaboration with other partners to share the ownership of properties. Uh, I know Martha mentioned it uh, at least one time where you have a group of investors that are owning the property and making decisions on how uh, it's going to be managed or what kind of property insurance, what kind of property managers they use, maybe insurance as well. In that case, you want to have something called director and officers insurance. You'll see, explain how that works. So that's a professional liability policy. It's very simple. When you have especially um, active investors, and then you've got the passive, the silent investors, and you have the active investors, the operators make decisions with other people's money. And for whatever reason, it's a wrong decision that they made for which property management they hired, whatever other finance company they went or other any other thing. And that brings a financial loss the people um, that make those directors and offices, those decisions can be personally, personally sued. So you want to make sure if you raise capital for deals, so looking to get a policy like this. It's not something that's being uh, offered around by different agents, but that's why we're here today. Well said, well said. You've all heard about commercial general liability. It is the liability coverage for everything that uh, has to do with slip and falls and people getting injured on the property, assault and battery, all those other types of things. We have something called lesser's risk liability. It's professional liability that you can get as an owner or you can have one of your employees or your team of employees, your company to have, or your, or your property manager. And this is the insurance policy that protects you and defends you from uh, wrongful uh, tenant screening, uh, that you are uh, sued for discrimination because you refuse to allow someone to uh, inhabit a building uh, because you, uh, you evicted somebody, wrongful eviction. Uh, your rent collection is unfair or uneven or something like that. You do repairs in some parts of the property and not other parts of the property. You're inconsistent in how you manage the property. People can sue you for that. And your commercial liability does not cover it. It only covers physical in injury, not financial injury, which is what Lesser's Risk does. Then we have something called umbrella liability. It's piling on. It's basically like it sounds, an umbrella on top of your insurance policies 
to add additional dollars of coverage on top of your insurance. So here are some important property coverages. We're gonna go over this quickly because we're running out of time. The one you wanna look for is special. It covers just about everything on the property, fire, lightning theft, falling objects, spacecraft, and so on. <clears throat> That's the one you wanna look for. Broad just, to throw, and just to throw in a quick note, a special form is basically the insurance says, insurance company says, I'll cover you everything unless something specifically excluded. And broad is almost the same. And basic is literally only the things that are specifically described to be covered, that's covered. So you always want to try to look for the special form. Okay, go ahead on the coinsurance. That's, co that's a high, very important one. Coinsurance. The insurance company wants you to participate in the game. You can participate at 80% or 90% or 100%. Some percentages may be even different depending on who the uh, insurance company is. And that's your share. Uh, they, they'll pick up 80% of the tab and you pick up 20% of the tab, uh, depending on the situation. Here's the bottom line with coinsurance. This is kind of, you got to wrap your head about this. At the time of the loss, the property needs to be insured for at least 80% of the insured value. You got a building that's worth a million bucks to replace. You need to have it insured for at least 800,000 with 80% coinsurance. Otherwise, the insurance company is going to discount your insurance. That's where the coinsurance clause comes I say comes this, if it's a property with a replacement cost of a million dollars, you want to have it insured for a million one, <laughs> not for exactly. 800,000. But an event that you weren't a million, when it's for a million to replace, but you didn't have a million and you have less than that, please make sure that you got it at least to, not less than 800,000 so you complied with the coinsurance clause. And this is where replacement cost, uh, the concept of replacement cost becomes very important. Because if, for example, think of this backwards, ladies and gentlemen, a coinsurance at 80%, it actually works more in your favor, but the cost of the insurance is a little higher. A coinsurance clause of 100% doesn't work in your favor because the cost of construction is going up all the time and the insurance has to keep increasing to keep up with it. And you gotta know what that number is Otherwise, if you're not at 100% of coinsurance at the time of the loss, they, they adjust the claim down. They depreciate the claim. So this gets into replacement cost, actual cash value, or agreed amount. I'm sure some of you know what these terms mean. Replacement cost means basically what does it cost to replace the building exactly with the same construction type, uh, square footage, and so on, uh, building purpose at the time that it was built, not today. Actual cash values, we take that factor and we depreciate it by the age of the building and wear and tear. An agreed amount is a fixed number. You wanna add anything to that, Yossi? Yes, I ask sometimes real estate owners, what is the amount of coverage you want? It's always our job. This is where I, this needs to be changed. Agents can advise, but owners need to know how to request. Literally, if you, have hands on the ground. You really want to ask your people, your contractor, you're in this business fully, what would cost if this building goes bad? What would it cost to replace this per square feet? What would be the cost of construction? Then you get that cost and you just multiply it $150 per <clears> feet, <throat> then just take the total square footage of the building, multiply it, and that's the amount of coverage you want. If there's a bank putting in different numbers, that changes the game. But you want to know by yourself Take control. What is the amount of coverage I need for this building? Get that from your contractor. Sometimes a policy will exclude named storms. Okay, we had one just a few months ago called Ian. Imagine if you didn't have coverage for that. Ordinance or law, we talked about that. Water damage, which is latent uh, damage oftentimes unless the pipes burst in our example before. And business income and extra expense is actually insurance that helps replace the loss of rent for the period of time the building is under uh, reconstruction, repair, or whatever. I'm gonna stop for a second and declare that it is now one hour. Shall we continue or go to questions? George, you're in charge.
Hey, I'm having fun. I don't know about anyone else, but <laughs> this is great, guys. Uh, let's let's hear what you got. Thank you. We will continue. And uh, those of you who have questions, we will even stay late uh, to answer all of your questions this afternoon, evening, awesome. depending on Make where sure you... you put them in the chats. Uh, I want to see that chat start to get loaded up with questions. So okay. don't hold back. Sounds great. Sounds great. And I mentioned liability. We were talking about uh, pets, uh, pet friendly places. Again, a great opportunity if you can manage it well, a huge liability if you don't. So why is it important to maintain ac accurate property coverage limits? We talked about that just a minute ago. We mentioned that uh, coinsurance has a lot to do with how the loss or the claim is paid for by the insurance company. And the coinsurance requires that you have to fit that percentage, that ratio at the time of the loss, not the time you get the policy. Ordinance and law is based on what that number is as well. So if, you're, uh, if your claim is discounted for uh, being under the property being underinsured, your ordinance and law coverage, which is the subcomponent of that, is also going to be discounted. You're going to get hurt twice especially on an older building. Now, some of you folks out here have heard about something called scheduled or blanket policies. I'm hearing from uh, investors and uh, real estate people that uh, blanket policy sounds like a great way to go. Gee, um, it's uh, cheaper, uh, it's more simple, uh, it's easier for me to understand. Uh, let's talk about the pros and cons of the scheduled or the blanket. First of all, Jacob, let's break in. What is a scheduled policy? Let's talk baby now. I'm glad you asked. Thank you. A scheduled policy is a specific insurance. It's the most convenient way to insure a commercial property. We take a single separate limit of coverage and apply to the building, to uh, adjacent buildings, to business personal property, and all the other coverage that are scheduled on the policy with sublimits and different limit amounts. This is what you see most of the time in a property policy. It's pretty straightforward. You know what the number is. The disadvantage is keeping everything scheduled and adjusting the schedule. If you do improvements, you do uh, changes, you remodel, you gotta make sure you have all those things done and updated as well. Blanket insurance is something a little different. You pick one number and everything comes in that bucket. And blanket comes is in two different versions. We call vertical and horizontal. In a, in a vertical policy, we have coverage A, coverage B, your business property, the building itself, the adjacent properties, and everything that's property falls into one, bill, one bucket. An example would be a million dollars for everything at one, a, one address. This can be a claims advantage if you have the right or the wrong kind of claim at the time of loss. However, it can also be a disadvantage depending on how the policy is structured. Horizontal coverage is blanket coverage, but it can be in multiple locations. So now you can have three buildings in three different locations all under the same policy with one big number. And, and that big number could be actually less than the sum of the total parts. So you have $5 million worth of building, but you only buy $3 million worth of horizontal blanket insurance, fine. Here's the disadvantage. If you have a multiple location loss, like a natural disaster, like Ian here in Florida, and you've got a blanket policy on three apartment buildings, but the actual policy limits isn't enough for the sum of all three buildings, now you got a problem. Right. It's also a lot more complicated when it comes to underwriting and premiums because now the insurance underwriter and the agent need to kind of figure out what is a good number for this and what fits your budget, your appetite for risk and so on. You wanna add anything to that, Yossi? Yeah, but, but it happened and big, I just renewed this, this huge one. It was 72 million in property value. It was the uh, uh, SOV uh, Excel spreadsheet of 40 locations. There was not, wasn't even an option in the industry to do coverage per location. The insurance company just layered it out and just did blanket. It just became so popular to do it that way. Sure. 
And again, it, it can be financial advantage too, as long as you don't have something that causes multiple location losses, blanket policies can be a good thing. Right. So just to get it straight, if you have an every building, right, insured separately, then you're getting the every building equivalent coverage. But if you got 10 buildings all together, right, maybe you're not putting up full coverage for each building, but just the total bottom line amount is a big amount, 10 million, 50 million. So that works because if you have just one location bad damage, you didn't have a location to any specific building. It's blanket, correct? Correct. Versus Okay, but if you have a natural disaster, then you're bad shape. Just want to make sure very clear. Okay. Well, I'm taking your example. Thank you for uh, laying that out. You got $72 million worth of property and $50 million worth of blanket coverage. And Hurricane Ian comes in. It's all in the same location. They all get wiped out. Now what do you do? You just right. lost $25 million. Correct. Okay. So why are multifamily properties underinsured? We talked about cost of construction. We talk about antiquated estimating methods. You can't just go by square footage. You have to actually do some math and some calculation. There are tools that uh, insurance agents, uh, risk managers and insurance companies use to actually calculate cost of construction based on what is more local in your area and not just use a round number. They include uh, cost of construction in your zip code, that type of construction with building materials and what current costs of the labor for the construction can be. Nobody routinely reviews the replacement costs. We talked about that as well. You need to review the replacement costs and see that it's keeping up with inflation and with the cost of construction. Otherwise you're uninsured. And now you have that problem we mentioned before about coinsurance. <clears throat> Here are some common property exclusions. The things that they take out of the policy that you don't always notice, and you can see from the example, our two case studies, a couple of these items are here. Water damage, freezing pipes, theft, vandalism, malicious mischief, earth movement, construction, uh, construction to the property, uh, any kind of consequential losses, backup of sewer and drains, pollution, and named storm. Anything you want to add to that, Yossi? Yeah, explain what consequential losses is. Thank you for asking. Consequential losses can work in your favor. I wrote an article about that a couple of weeks ago. But uh, anyway, uh, the way it works is, let's say you have an exclusion for water damage on your property. And now the roof is torn open by uh, a hurricane and water comes pouring in through the roof and causes damage to the interior. Guess what? The cause of the loss was wind damage, and, a, and the consequential loss was the water damage. You can still file the claim, and the insurance company will pay it as long as there's no exclusion for consequential losses. Again, that's something in the fine print. You can have your water damage claim paid as long as the cause of the loss was actually a covered loss on the policy. So in a scenario, if you have a water damage exclusion, but you got a wind hail coverage and what a damage was a, a loss due to a consequence of a wind claim, you might still be able to push in to get covered, right? Exactly. Okay. We're almost done, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk briefly about vacant property. Probably very attractive to buy because everyone wants to get rid of that vacant property. You can pick it up for a shekel. But the problem with them is you need to look at them very, very closely. They're often damaged due to neglect. Um, they're very high risk from a liability and a vandalism, malicious mischief point of view. In the year 2020, 50% of vacant buildings in America suffered fire, theft, vandalism, malicious mischief, water damage, vermin, squatters, and criminal activity. Imagine the liability behind that. And by the way, even if you're buying the building and you're just inheriting this problem, imagine the cleanup behind all that. So you want to have a good inspection done. If I had a vacant property and, if, and I was considering it seriously, I would require in my contract that I have somebody inspect that building now. And before I take the keys, they inspect it again and it still has to pass. Otherwise, no deal. Have it ins thoroughly inspected by an independent inspector. That's the recommendation. 
then you might get a really good deal on that vacant property. In summary, do your homework on the proposed property. Request the existing insurance, the loss records, the rules, the leases, find out about turnover, ask your agent or risk manager to work on indications and get them involved early in the game so they can help you figure out what the real exposure behind this is and how much the insurance is gonna cost. That's gonna help you a lot with the profitability of this building and also an understanding of what kind of risk or hazard you and your team may have by taking this property on. Consider having your own property inspection, check the official records, location and appraisal, check out the property manager if you don't have your own, verify the replacement costs because the insurance numbers that they have may be completely off base and carefully review the OM for clues. And also I recommend, uh, and I'm sure George will agree with me, get a four point if, no, if nothing else, if it's not on the OM so that you know if the utilities and everything has been brought up to date in the last 10 or 15 years. Last but not least, balance the risk to your appetite and your intended return on investment. Now we're ready for questions. I see chat has four questions. Okay, wonderful. I wanna thank you, Jacob and Yossi. Let's start with the first question of the evening. You've seen basic policies that don't cover items you've mentioned like vandalism, law, ordinance, cost control, and so on. What might be the spread in premiums between the basic and a policy that covers all the items you've mentioned? That's from Martha Sandino. Hi, Martha. Um, do you want to take this, Josie, or is it my turn? No, that's your chance. Okay. I'll be the risk manager today. Oh, wait a minute. That's what you brought me here for. Uh the spread in premiums between basic and special ca causes of loss, the bottom and the top, so to speak, uh, it it's going to depend on all the variables we mentioned, Martha, um, but uh, the, the location of the property, the year of the property, uh, with the construction type, all of those are gonna take, be taken into consideration in the difference in cost of coverage between basic and special causes of loss. Uh, the, your answer is yes. Uh, somewhere between 20% and double is a good number. Okay, great. And then we had another question. Will the presentation be available? And yes, I'm going to put the presentation up at youtube.com slash at George Roberts III for posterity's sake. And Martha did have one follow-up. Will you review existing policies we may have to evaluate exclusions that we yeah. may have missed? George, Absolutely. answer on that, George. You All have... right. I was thinking I can actually take that because you know what? Yossi's great. He'll take a look at your policies and you'll come out learning like you're going to know 10 times more about insurance than when you went into the chat. So definitely go send it to, uh, to Yossi or Jacob and they'll take care of you. Absolutely, Martha. We got one more from George Griffiths. Storms are named when re winds reach 30 miles per hour and are classified as hurricanes at 119. Do exclusions usually apply when winds reach 30 miles or 119 miles per hour? Suppose that the storm is named in both scenarios. The named storm exclusion on a property insurance policy applies the minute the, pop, the, the storm is given a name. In many cases, most cases, and my uh, 45 years in Florida, uh, the storm has a name before it makes landfall. So we know if it's going to be covered or not. Did I answer the question? Yeah, that sounds good, unless there is any uh, request for follow up. I've got one for you. Suppose that an investor takes over a crime ridden property. What sort of things can the property owner do to reduce premiums? Now, I'm thinking of a few things that are kind of obvious. You can tell us whether these are effective or not. Let's say you have light sensor activated floodlights so that it's lit up all night. You put on cameras. You make it difficult to break in. Let's say you have no break in since the measures were taken. Uh, security system. What else? What can we do? And, and how much? I know it depends on the type of property, how old it is, et cetera. But what sort of reduction in premiums could you expect if you take something that's crime ridden and you turn it into something that is essentially much less affected by crime? 
I, I want to take that one uh, add on. Okay. okay. We're talking drudge about saving and premiums, right? Um, yes, things work like good presentations, not your typical underwriting. When you come in and say, we got security, this when we add on that Jacob did all the years, that for sure help. But I wanted to take you a different perspective of saving on premiums. Let's say you get that unhappy premium, which is uh, crazy what's going on now. Literally crazy. Okay. Renewals are unbelievable. But in that case, think about saving in premiums by not, not by not being increased crazy, right? So you got that claim. The claim happened, whatever it's a liability claim or whatever it is. If you had the security camera in place in whatever it is, or security or against phase, and that minimized the amount of the payout, or it gives you enough of a case to close out that claim, you already saved your account from going to a client with a big claim. To a, to a claim that happened, boom, closed, right? So you say, you know, George, when your policy gets losses on there, everybody turns around, George, I'm sorry for the non-renewal. You got this massive claim on all the agents start talking. If you got those things, think about saving money in the long run. That's what we call minimize your risk and increase your profitability, right? So you're buying the property, putting the cameras, and this Yossi or your broker friend still comes back with us big premium. Dude, I did this cameras. This is a bunch of loaning. Think about the long run when you have that good video representing for your attorney saying, boom, this story, this is Sultan Barry. This is, this is nonsense. Okay. Claim gets closed. You save money up front. Think of that perspective. But now to answer your question, I'll give Jacob. <laughs> uh, we've had cases, uh, very good cases, George, where Properties that were considered uninsurable for assault and battery or violent crime or whatever, we actually were able to turn those around by uh, good risk management procedures. In your case, in this example, security. Uh, the offense in the property, you have limited access, you have secure parking and all those other things. You document that, you submit it to the insurance company. They might say, you know what? Uh, we're not going to cover it now, but we'll see how you do. And the following year, you have no, no uh, crime claims, uh, no crime occurrences. And the, the second year, they pick up assault and battery. They'll start covering you for it. And by the way, at no additional premium. <laughs> we have cases all the time where uh, an exclusion that had historically been applied to a property was actually agreed to be removed provided that certain conditions were met, or actually instead of being ordered by the insurance company that we offered them. Hey, we've got a risk management program for this property. We're doing this and this and this. And they say, fine, in that case, we'll pick it up and we'll see how it goes. And, and by the way, if it goes well, you can be insured for these things that normally would be excluded. And if you file a claim, then we're gonna deny that. We'll exclude that next time around. Make sense? Yeah, great. And so that underscores the importance of having a holistic risk management approach and keeping in touch with your insurance broker. Absolutely. And vice versa, by the way, your insurance broker keeping in touch with you and keeping tabs on any of the changes, improvements, uh, remodeling work or whatever you've done to help improve the property that needs to be shared on a regular and routine basis because the next time the policy renews or the new property they're going for, when you walk into, uh, I'm gonna take your, step, your example a step further, George. You walk into a new property that's in a high crime area, but you've already got experience reducing crime in five other properties and we documented it through the risk management and safety and security procedures that you applied to these other five properties. We hand over the underwriter and he says, okay, George knows what he's doing. He hasn't had a claim in four other properties that had a history of this before. We'll take them right now. And by the way, if you can do this and this, we'll actually give you even a better break on the premium. It happens. Yeah, great stuff, Jacob. I just want to give everybody one last chance to ask questions. If you have questions, you can put that in the chat. Or how about this? I'm going to show everybody on my screen right now. And if you want to ask something directly, here's your opportunity. No, going once. Yes, I just wanted to add a Martha 
she said she heard several times about loss runs she's asking and george i know you're looking a couple deals on the loss runs i want you to experience that before even insurance rates experience that the next deal if you're looking at anyone's like like try this out live right if you get a loss run report and you see it's clean good a good proof to your good taste on the deal you're looking at right if you can get all this fine and you get a loss report with several liability on there, boom, you got more information that you wouldn't get until now. So to answer your question, loss runs, if you can just get out of the seller a copy of their existing policy, just not, nah, not even a copy, just the name of the insurance companies for the last three to five years with the policy number, just give that to me. Um, I have my assistant, George Griffiths. He's, I just, we signed up with the company. We can ha help you get those loss runs free of charge to you. Okay. You just, it's up to you, George. Uh, if you want to look for five years of loss history, do five years. Reach out to me with your policy number of your seller and their insurance company's names. That's all. Hand it to me. Within the same week, I hand over the loss runs to you and we can review it together. Yeah, great. great advice. You want to know what's going on in the property and you want to know what it's going to cost to insure next year. Yep. Okay. All right, good stuff. Well, hey, I want to thank you, gentlemen. Great show tonight. We're going to put this out on the internet at YouTube, at least at youtube.com slash at George Roberts III. And we're going to make sure this is preserved for posterity. A lot of great information here. We're going to get 10,000 downloads. No problem, George. You're the All man. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. All right. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.